President Franklin battled how the um, climate alarmists can get away with what they get away with. Anyway, a young man here um, asked them 10 questions on Twitter and I thought it was worth making a short video about it so we can see what his questions are and discuss them a little. So here we go. Logical questions that the alarmists can never answer. Question 1. You claim that the Earth is overheating, that it's too hot. So what is the correct global mean surface temperature? It's known as the GMST for life on Earth. And why? Please provide numerical answer, use units and round it to the nearest tenth of a degree Celsius. Then explain why that value is ideal and cite evidence to justify your answer. Well, first of all, there's no such thing as a global mean temperature. It's meaningless. Uh, I'll give you an idea. In Antarctica, one year can go from minus 76 to minus 74, give two degrees warming, having huge influence on the global temperature. When that's meaningless, you can have regions of the Earth and say, well, yeah, that's the mean temperature there, that's the mean temperature there. You can do that, but you can't add it all together with any meaning at all. That's number one. Number two. Now, if we were to warm, and we're warming from the globes if we do, and this is really important, well, we're warming from the poles, sorry, if we do, and so warming from each end of the Earth towards the equator, the equator doesn't change very much, um, not at all, where the warming is from the poles. Now, if you go back to medieval warm period, a thousand years ago, when we had black spruce trees, um, which are now 80 miles north, which can't grow now, um, but 80 miles north of the tree belt in Canada. Um, that's what you'd have. So if we added one degree centigrade to the Earth, then we would be back to that. So we would be back to maybe the Romans um, having uh, vineyards in Northumbria and things like that. And so we'd be better off. Everything would move forward, well, northward by about 80 miles. So the south coast of England would get the temperatures of what's 80 miles south, maybe Paris or something. That's what they'd be getting the temperatures of. It isn't like you think. And in fact, if you look at what's happened with the warming since the Little Ice Age, the crop yields have all exploded, not just due to CO2, but a large part due to CO2. So crop yields in Africa, the hot part, great, look at them. Crop yields in um, Brazil, look at them all, all terrific. Today we have world record crops. So the increase in temperature we've had since the Little Ice Age has been totally beneficial and has been able in, in, in places like India completely keep up with the um, actual growth in population. And overall, the world's producing more food than it's ever done before. And not just the CO2, big part, but the other part is the fertilizer coming from fossil fuels. Without those, you're looking at billions of people dying. So let give me, again, I'll come back to the question, can the alarmists give me a temperature that they like, that they'd like to go back to? And do they think that just controlling that CO2 back somehow would do that? Because that's silly. Our second question, what is the correct atmospheric CO2 level for life on Earth? What is the best to optimise our agricultural productivity? What CO2 level will make the weather less scary? Give your answer as an exact value as a mole fraction or volume percentage and then explain why that value is ideal. This question um, really exposes the absurdity of the whole thing. They don't know what value to go back to. Now, we're about 285 or so pre-industrial in 1850 and we're now about 427, 426, somewhere around there. Parts per million, that is. So what value do we go back to in there? incredibly ultimate world. I don't know. We recently asked um, the consultant um, advisor in the Isle of Man, by the way, uh, uh, and we've got it on record, um, what the, what, 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 you know, meant to be a climate expert, what, what the percentage was of CO2 in the atmosphere. His first figure was 600. Not a clue. Then he settled on the 400-ish, about right. And when asked what's the ideal one, he said 250. 250 is lower than pre-industrial. It would cause mass famines and billions of people to die. These people are following a cult. They do not know what 
what they're talking about, to put it bluntly. I mean, we want more CO2, not less. More CO2 is plant food, after all. That's what it is. So our question number three. It's a fairly long one. What exactly makes CO2 pollution? The EPA, that's the Environmental Protection Authority in America, considers CO2 to be a pollutant, legally speaking, under the Clean Air Act. And the scientific justification is simply that it, quote, contributes to greenhouse gas pollutant that threatens public health and welfare. Chris then goes on to state, that's pretty ambiguous, because by that measure, water vapour should also be classified as a pollutant, because it's also a greenhouse gas. It's also the most abundant and potent greenhouse gas. It absorbs a wider spectrum of infrared wavelength than CO2. So what makes CO2 a pollutant? Problem these days. We've got our Prime Minister in the UK and Ed Miliband, his mad, mad zealot, you know, pursuing these things, which, by the way, a report out today from Net Zero Watch says could cost by 2050 each household £300,000, right, in this madness to achieve nothing, by the way. But um, here we've got water vapour being far more powerful as a greenhouse gas far more um, than CO2, but that's not a pollutant. You see, you've got government departments just following a cult. It's like all our councils in the UK, you know, declaring net zero emergencies and not even able to define it. We are being controlled by mad people. We are being controlled by cultists right the way through governments in the West. And it's demolishing our way of living. It's demolishing our industries. And this is just a typical example of calling plant food, because that's what CO2 is, plant food, calling it a pollutant. Wow. Now for question number four. Why are temperature departures from 1850 to 1900 climate conditions deemed as the human welfare control knob, given that the overall human condition has never been better than it is today? How is was the climate during the Little Ice Age, the coldest period of the last 10,000 years, preferable to today's? On what account was the weather more benign? By what measure? Be specific. Tell me how the climate was supposedly less dangerous in the 17th and 19th centuries. I have to say this is one of the questions I ask other people most of the time, and they never have an answer, of course, because what are we expected to be considered to be good going back to pre-industrial or going back to actually up to 1900 because weather conditions were terrible much more extreme weather much bigger storms much bigger famines terrible crop failures um, and an inability of a real poverty uh, and um, that's what we're supposed to go back to worse weather you see the idea that weather today is more extreme is totally false and even the IPCC themselves agree with me on most of those things. The only thing they say is warming. As regards tropical storms and all the rest droughts, they say there's no indication yet of man-made interference with them. Right? They can't find any evidence that man has changed any of those things. And that's not me saying that's the IPCC. So, I mean, what are they wanting us to go back to? Do they want us to go back to the Thames frozen over? Do they want us to go back to all, all of that and live in those conditions? Because that seems to be what they're asking. So ask them. Ask, you know, these people who argue with you about this. What do they want us to go back to? When was the right weather? When was the weather right? And if you're going to blame CO2 from the industrial uh, revolution and onwards, then you really ought to start looking at China, by the way, who's done incredible amounts of CO2. Much more CO2 in China out in a few years than we've managed to do since 1850. So, but no one's talking about that because the entire thing here is political. And in the meantime, we've got the Ed Millibands of this world driving us into poverty. You know what? As a socialist, he's hurting the poorest of us most. Now, whilst this question five applies to America, the message really applies everywhere. The Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, that the President Biden signed into law in 2022 was popularised as the biggest climate bill in history. But ever since the bill was signed, climate alarmists insist climate change has only gotten worse. Why are we not seeing the bill work? It's magic. Now, the fact is that none of the conferences in the world, none of the legislation in the world, 
all this thing like Biden's done, what we've done, makes no difference at all to the growth of CO2. Just look at this graph here. This is a graph of CO2 over time, you know, with all the conferences plotted on it. And those conferences don't even dent the CO2 graph, which is growing continually. So it's just ridiculous deceit on the part of, well, the entire Western world. Oh, there's deceit from the East as West with China, who pretends to be green. So look at the CO2 production from China, for example, now compared to the UK. Here's the graph. Right. <laughs> China's put more CO2 into the atmosphere in a short period than we have in the entire history since 1850, the Industrial Revolution start. But they get a lot off the hook. They're allowed somehow to escape. It basically is all a left-wing, nuttish conspiracy, this, to control us. It's as simple as that. That may sound, how can I put it, you know, sort of ridiculous. But that's the only conclusion I can come to. Because all this madness seems to be coming from the left. And it is mad. And it makes no difference. So whilst we've lost all the jobs in our steel industry, maybe up to 10,000 people affected in Port Talbot, while we're closing down Grangemouth, our oil refinery, cost of thousands of jobs, there's the promise of green jobs to come based on ridiculous, ridiculous assumptions. You are being deceived, you are being lied to, and it's making no difference whatsoever if the whole of the UK sank below the waves, and with it Europe, and with it North America, and with it South America, it would still make no difference. CO2 would still continue to grow. I'm grateful for that because we want more CO2, not less. But that is the state of, that's just a factual, well it's just a fact. And it's really great deceit on behalf of our governments right round the world. Well, question six. If we spend $75 trillion to decarbonise the economy by 2050, and by the way, it's an enormous amount for the UK as well, could be as much as £300,000 per household, according to a recent report from Net Zero Watch, by how much will it reduce the GMST by the end of the century? That's the temperature. Please provide your answer to the nearest tenth of a degree Celsius and show your calculations. What does the perfect climate look like? How will we know when we get there? By what measure? Of course, they can't answer any of those questions. They haven't got a clue. Now, normally when governments are spending trillions or even spending small amounts, they have to look at the benefit we get from the spending. Cost benefit, as old as the hills. Doesn't apply, doesn't apply to the, the, this subject at all. They don't have to justify. They just have to use scare tactics based on based on scares that even people like the IPC, their own people, can't accept are true. It's unbelievable how our politicians think we have extreme weather events like floods and, and droughts and all those things, when, when the, actually the IPCC is not claiming that, but the politicians from it are. This is purely political. That's where it comes down to. And it's political to get control of you because if they control energy like they are planning and they are doing more and more, they'll control every aspect of your life. Question 7. The estimated cost of net zero by the year 2050 in the US is $75 trillion, $3 trillion a year, according to the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. That's a hefty price tag. And with circa 260 million adult taxpayers, it would cost each of us $288,461.54 to get to net zero emissions by the target date. That's three to six years worth of people's salaries. Are you willing to shell out that money, or do you just expect that everyone else will foot the bill for you? Secondly, if you don't know the answer to question six, then are we supposed to just spend the $75 trillion and see what happens? Well, I'm going to translate those figures to the UK for you, because Net Zero Watch have just done a report on this, and they're putting the cost of Net Zero by 2050 at £300,000 per household. So, you know, you, you, this is the same sort of order as the USA. And for what benefit? For nothing. You won't be able to see any benefit at all to the climate. And actual fact, we could do with a bit more warming. You know, frankly, if everything shifted up north by 80 miles, Scotland would be about a lot happier, uh, um, England would be a lot happier, 
Ireland would be a lot happier, Europe would, and so on. And it wouldn't really increase the temperatures at the equator. You know, it, it's sort of at the poles, as I've said before, where you get the temperature increases. And we've had much hotter times than that in the past, in the medieval warm period and the Roman warm period. I've done videos with evidence all over the world. They were global events. So there we are. I just found it unbelievable that um, anyone could fall for this. And this is what frustrates me so much and why I make so many videos on the subject. Question eight. If combating climate change is a global concerted effort, why do China and India get a free pass to continue emitting carbon dioxide without band? Well, I need to do a bit of history here to explain this. It's quite an interesting fiddle. Going back uh, um, to the COP meeting in 2016, uh, and the big one, then it was agreed that the West would start to do all this net zero limitation. But because China and India and other countries like that um, were underdeveloped relatively, they could carry on what in China could carry on in particular to build as many coal power stations as it wanted until 2030. And only then would it start to comply with restrictions. What this meant, of course, was they built coal power stations as if there's no tomorrow and, and they're still building them two a week. So this is why you get that steep CO2 curve I've already shown you for China and the same the case for India. But um, what's going to happen after 2030 is they're not going to close them all. So all these incredible thousands of new coal power stations are going to carry on pumping out. That is the fiddle. A lot of people don't know that that was what they agreed to. And I was on GB News only last week. And I'll be doing separate programmes on these. I've got three to do, actually, on the last three weekends. Uh, and when I asked Jim Dale this, his answer was quite interesting. Here it is. <laughs> well, not, why aren't you having really, to with China, Jim? You're, you're, OK, the China thing. Look, we've all got to do our little bit. China may well be doing... <laughs> Over overburning the CO2, etc. But that doesn't mean just pack it in because we've got all that control of ourselves. And if we don't do our little bit, then somebody else won't do theirs. If we don't do our little bit, then no one else will do theirs. This is just ignoring reality. That curve, that vertical curve of China that I've shown Jim on the program, the same one I've just shown you. Just ignoring reality. China is, and everyone else is just laughing at us. But this argument, they're not willing, the left aren't willing to criticise communist regimes like China. Just not willing to do it. You know, they get a free pass. And to argue that we have to do our little bit and totally ruin our economy, exporting our steel industry to China. So when we buy the quality steel in now, which we can only get from China, we have to ship it all across the oceans, increasing the CO2. The whole thing is utter, utter madness. They've but we will continue to the second point. Got to, because it makes no difference. What Jim's advocating makes no difference. That graph says it all. China's put more in a very short time of CO2 into the atmosphere than we have in the whole time. They're also leading on, on solar right, power listen, as well, Paul. Well, well, they you know like that. And that's another standard excuse. They're also leading on solar panels, you know that. Yes, they're making the rope for us in the West for us to hang ourselves, supplying us with solar panels. They're not mad. You know, they're not mad, but this seems to give Jim the excuse for them to build two coal power stations a week. There is no sense in this left wing nonsense. And that's why the entire subject is political. It is not scientific. And question nine. Why are you so vehemently opposed to the deployment of nuclear power? It is the safest, most sustainable carbon free energy technology. And without the compliance regulations, isn't expensive when compared to solar PV and wind, which are inefficient, intermittent and costly, and I mean very costly, by the way, add-ons to existing electricity generation sources. Well, that may apply in the USA, but not so much in the UK, because we seem to accept the role for nuclear. It's just that we've mismanaged it. Well, a number of governments in the past have mismanaged it. We've left the lead go. We started nuclear power in the world. We were the first at it. And um, we just let it all go. France took it up. 70% of their energy at one time, and most of that now still comes from nuclear. And they benefited from that enormously. But we could do a lot more. 
it's just that we can't organize ourselves but talking about these small modular reactors i personally favor the stable cell reactor which uses waste from the old nuclear industry so it, it makes old waste old nuclear waste safer and has a, a fuel that's costing us to just keep it safe and we can reduce that burden and, and make and make power out of it and and we, we've got enough for a long time for that matter we could also be fracking and there may be enough for hundreds of years of really cheap power so um this particular topic doesn't really apply to the uk but i'm completing uh, um, chris's complete set of questions that, that he's put to the world if humans are a parasite to the earth since we are destroying it why then are you worried that climate change would wipe us all out would not be better for the earth why don't you be the change you want to see and net zero yourself i wouldn't say that's the best of questions there chris but um, I think the point behind it is this. The whole net zero movement is anti-human. It's anti-Western civilization as well. It's wanting a complete world order. It's wanting quangos and unelected people to control us. It, um, governments are handing over power to quangos and organizations all the time that control their populations. And this has to stop. And so net zero is just part of a bigger agenda. But it's the driving tool, it's the wedge that can change our behaviour. And they're quite open about it. We need to change behaviour. So I'll leave you with a thought. There's two kinds of dangers. One is what I just yeah. talked about, that we've arranged a society based on science and technology in which nobody understands anything about science and technology. And this combustible mixture of ignorance and power, sooner or later, is going to blow up in our faces. I mean, who is running the science and technology in a democracy if the people don't know anything about it? And the second reason that um, I'm worried about this is that science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. If, if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us Mm -hmm. that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious, who comes ambling along. It, it's a thing that Jefferson lay great stress on. It wasn't enough, he said, to enshrine some rights in a, in a constitution or a bill of rights. The people had to be educated and they had to practice their skepticism mm -hmm. and their education. Otherwise, we don't run the government. The government runs us.